Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Well, it's wonderful to see you, friends, here. You're going to gather again from various uh, different churches and backgrounds and fellowships and some perhaps from no particular fellowship, but you you come along, and it's wonderful to see you. We're taking the theme of Cracking Life's Code. It's rather a pretentious title. But there we are, Revelation chapter 5, and Sally read it so beautifully for us a moment or two ago. So let's have a look then at this last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5. If you've got it there and you want to follow, please do. Otherwise, just let it listen. So, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. So I entitled this, Who Can Crack the Code? What are we on about? Why, the blockbuster challenge as to who, if anyone, can come up with a satisfying explanation of our existence. That's what it's about. I was once chairman of a board of governors of a school in London, and we were needing to have a new head teacher. So we put out the adverts, and we got down to the short list of three people who were interviewed for this post of head teacher. And I usually, well, with each one, in fact, I ended up with a fairly direct question. 
I said to them, please describe now your world view. Each of them in turn looked puzzled and said, world view? Yeah, I'd say, all I mean by that is your interpretation of the meaning of life on this world. <laughs> or they'd say, well, we need a bit of time for that. No, no, I'd say, bullet points will do. <laughs> they couldn't do it, none of them. They all three fell flat on their face, one after another. Couldn't even begin to answer that question. And afterwards I said to the governors, look, there's no way we can have these people on staff as head teacher. After all, I said, education is much more than a matter of getting your mathematics right or getting your history dates correct, things like that. We are trying to help these girls and boys to establish their relationship to the universe. And if the head teachers haven't yet sorted that out for themselves, then why on earth should we appoint them? And we didn't. We re-advertised. Well, this fifth chapter of Revelation puts the issue very clearly. Here's the writer. Here's the Apostle John. Exiled by the hostile Roman Empire on a lonely island, but privileged there with a series of God-given visions, which, down the centuries, have comforted and equipped oppressed believers in their calling to show the world how we outlast tyrannies. And right here, John sets out for his readers the universal dilemma of putting together a satisfying worldview that can make sense of life. There are golden answers here in this fifth chapter of Revelation. The first clue is given by that single word, worthy. We heard it read earlier on. Worthy is the Lamb who died. Worthy, worthy, worthy. I see it here in verse 2. Who is worthy? Verse 4. Verse 9, verse 12, that gives us a strong clue as to what we're on about. In the vision, the angel's challenge is, who is worthy to open and decipher the scroll of life and its meaning? And above all, that person has got to be worthy. Can't just have some second-rate character there. No. Actually, it's a bit like the fable of Cinderella and the kingdom-wide quest to find out whose foot would fit the slipper. But here, search is on for one person, the one person, who can break the seals of this mysterious scroll and then reveal the secrets that it contains. So in this vision, ladies and gentlemen, a tiny corner of God's curtain is lifted for us just to peep behind and see the center of the universe. Not the geographical center, the spiritual center. And so John finds himself in his vision in the very throne room of God Almighty. And then here's this loud voice, who in all existence is worthy to open the scroll? Who can crack the code? So our first observation from this passage is this. There's no harder task. No harder task. Is there anywhere someone who can unfold the world's secrets and give an adequate interpretation of the meaning of life down here, who can give a credible rationale of history, its direction, its goal, its culminating point. In short, to give a satisfying explanation of the world's destiny. Who can unravel that? No possible harder task could be set. It's true today. Maybe years ago people might ask, you know, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, people would say, what is the truth? That's not asking that question so much now. They're saying, what is the point? What's the point of what's going on? The purpose behind everything. Strange television plays will come out with that, asking that question. By implication, what's the point of anything? In John's vision, the task is made harder still because the one who breaks open the scroll secrets, is evidently also expected to action the divine program. So, it won't be enough for the aspiring candidate simply to step forward and say, well, I'll be a commentator. I'll be your interpreter from an armchair. No. This so hard-to-find individual is required to open each of the seals to be executive of the program and carry it through. 
Imagine a football game. And there's a big football game tonight. Chelsea against Barcelona. Maybe that's taken about one or two people who might have been here. But you're here. That's better. <laughs> Something better here. I could have been watching that. I was watching Arsenal last night against Manchester United. I'm an Arsenal supporter, actually. It was a fairly poor match. Perhaps it'll be a poor match tonight. You never know. But imagine a football game in which the call goes out for somebody to be commentator, team coach, and captain on the field, all in one. And furthermore, to be worthy. That is morally perfect. Well, that's observation number one. There's no harder task. Secondly, there's no sadder cry than the cry we find in this passage. The cry that comes from the inability to explain our existence. So here in chapter 5, verse 4, John declares, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. I remember some years ago going to see Tom Stoppard's play Hapgood at the Aldwych Theatre in London's West End. And I remember the American man who kindly invited my wife and me to go and see this play. He warned me beforehand. He said, Richard, I have to warn you, the plot is somewhat complicated. Well, I was ready then on the edge of my seat as the play began. I said, okay, I must get hold of this plot right away. And as the curtain went up, there was confusion everywhere on stage. Shots were being fired. There was strobe lighting. Figures running and darting about everywhere. I never got the plot. My wife got it. I never did. I got even, I never even got near it. I was only comforted coming out at the end, seeing the advertising hoarding outside. You don't have to be Einstein to understand this play, but it helps. <laughs> Well, this has been the cry of the centuries. In many cultures, we can't understand the plot. That brilliant Greek thinker of old, Xenophanes, said, guesswork is overall. Or in our own day, the prolific filmmaker, David Putnam, he lamented, I'm quoting, now it seems to me, as soon as you are born, the only absolutely certain thing is you are going to die. I have to say it is a dismal prospect to think that there is no more to it than that. That you go out like a light and that's it. It makes a mockery of the whole purpose of living. Well, friends, it's not that there's been no candidate for this title role of universal teacher for the human race. Over time, individuals have stepped forward. Indeed, entire systems of thought have arisen and have prevailed for a while, stretching across whole regions. The contenders, there have been many. Whether it's the dialectical materialism of Karl Marx, or the animism of ancient Africa, or the lure of the East, each shows us something of engagement, but so often there's an accompanying wistful thought, why is this not working? Why am I still confused? about my existence and my destiny. So as a church minister, I've met many people who've looked into these different systems of thought. I mean, at All Souls Church, we had 70 different nationalities coming every Sunday. Many of them told me that in the end, they were obliged to turn away from each contender and say, yeah, you've got a lot to offer us, but no, you're not the one. You're not the one. So in his vision, the evangelist John weeps at the inability of the entire universe to produce somebody who can explain. There's no harder task. There's no sadder cry. But, thirdly, there's no fitter candidate than Christ. I'm on verse 5 here. Then one of the elders, they were part of the group in the vision surrounding God's throne, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Hey, there it is. Weep not. Earlier in the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, 
verse 17, it was fear not. Now it's weep not. Christ is the single unifying reason why, for example, we call the system around us a universe and not a multiverse. The very word university, take that word. Why, that's a combination of two Latin words. Uni, one, veritas, truth. One truth. That's what the universities were on about when they began. Most of our universities, all of our early universities were Christian. I went to Cambridge University. Emmanuel College, Christ College, Trinity College, St. John's College, Jesus College. They all had Christian names. And what were those people saying? They were saying, let's set up universities to study the truth, the one truth about our world. Oh, there would have been different subjects, of course, physics or mathematics or music, but those were separate chapters in one overarching story, slices cut out of the single cake. But over the last 300 years, there's been a massive loss of confidence, especially in the West. And that's resulted in a collection of highly diverse and irreconcilable stories, or narratives as they call them. There are as many narratives as there are narrators. My story, there's your story, there's the feminist story, there's the Marxist story. So the assembling of a worldview is hugely important for us all to get this right. I remember when I was uh, talking with um, some of my friends at the, uh, on the governors, you know, we talked about, of course, the university curriculums, how it's wind in an extraordinary way in some places. You can now do Star Trek studies. You can do David Beckham studies if you want. So today, the idea that there is one story, one person, or one factor that dominates all of life and the universe is dismissed today in many circles. The result is that we are now getting a generation of ex-students who more than any other in living memory cannot establish their relationship to the universe around them. What actually, friends, is our Christian answer to this quest for a satisfactory meaning to life? Why? It comes with overwhelming clarifying force in terms of the books of Genesis through to the Revelation. The creation and the culmination of all things. The granite truth of God at work in creation, in the shape and goal of our human story, why that tells us all we need to know. The shackles of determinism melt away before its onslaught. The negative gospel of a meaningless universe shatters into pieces as we come to grips with this book. Do not weep, says the Bible. There is someone, central to all history, who is qualified to open the scroll and break its seals. And again, I remember that time with the school governors when we had sent away the, the poor three failed candidates. Then one of the board members said to me, Richard, could you just uh, tell us, uh, would you kind of tell us your worldview? I said, sure. I said, the, the assembling of my worldview it's like the putting together of a little raft on the seas with which I can negotiate the currents and the heavy seas of modern thought. And I said at the centre of my raft is a mast. At the top of the mast is a little flag saying, Jesus Christ. So I said at the very centre of my worldview, it's a Christian worldview, I want Christ to be at the unmistakable centre of everything to do with life, eternity, creation, everything. He's got to be at the center. Then I said, my raft is made up of four planks. Four mighty planks. And they're really the truths that undergird the Bible. First plank, creation. They were not just a collection of biochemical reactions existing in a strange, impersonal, mechanistic universe. No. At the heart of all things is a person who has made us in his own image to live with him in an eternal friendship and everything that we see around us comes from a heart of love and creativity that beats at the center of all things. That explains so much creation. The second plank, 
of my raft, of my worldview, I call the fall, by which we understand that the whole human race entered into a state of rebellion against the Creator, that we are an offense to him, and that the tragedies and the conflicts and the evils that we see in our world today stem directly out of that initial rebellion. As intended custodians of the surrounding creation as humans, our sin affected even the environment. That, again, explains, friends, so much. The Marxists never got hold of it at all. They were looking for a utopian ideal, a perfectible society, a worker's paradise that they thought was attainable in this life. Of course they were going to be disillusioned all down the line. Christians don't think like that one little bit. Sure, we're aiming for perfection in all we do, and in our own characters also. We're aiming for 100%, anything less, and we're backsliders. We're aiming for the top, but knowing that in this life it won't be achieved. Now we can live with that tension once we understand it. The fall. Two great planks, the creation, the fall. That explains everything. Third plank is obvious. It's the plank of redemption, as we call it. Because God has reached down to us in love and came in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to re redeem us, redemption, to reclaim us by the power of his cross. That gives us great optimism. It tells us that no person is beyond being forgiven and reclaimed. And as they repent, put their trust in this Savior, once crucified, now alive forever. When we're faced, even by the most evil of horrors in our world today, any person is reclaimable. No person, no situation need ever be written off. Never. The fourth plank is what I call the final triumph. Namely, that history is moving towards a conclusion when the empire of evil will be dismantled at the universal return of Christ and that he will usher in what is called the new heaven and the new earth which will incorporate all those who are in his redeemed family forever. That too gives Christians great confidence in their work and witness in the most inhospitable regions of the world. We know how the whole thing is going to end. It's worth then persevering to that final triumph. We know how it's going to end. We've read the last page in the Bible. We know. Well, once get those four mighty planks in place, and we will find that we have a handle on every single issue in sight. Wealth creation, sport, the family, sex, conflict, war, all of those things. We'll find that we're able to cope in some way or other with education, politics, We'll have something to say with the insights gained by one or other or all four of these four mighty planks which make up our Christian worldview with the whole thing centered in the person of Jesus Christ. So here's this key figure in John's vision. Verse 5, as he now approaches center stage, the Lion of Judah he's called, the Root of David. That's two royal titles. What more powerful than a lion? But then comes the surprise. In his vision, John cranes his neck to see this royal personage who's coming forward. And all he can see is a lamb. A lamb that in fact has been slain. Three times. Verses 6, 9, and 12. Mention is made of his having been slain. It's that figure at center point with the message of the cross that paradoxically unfolds the secret of history. It's a lamb that has been slain because it's now all too obviously alive. As he comes forward, do you see verse 7? Takes the scroll from the one on the throne. So the lamb proves in the minds of all the onlookers to be the perfect qualified interpreter. And the cross bisects history. The lamb with its seven horns, verse 6, denoting perfect power, his seven eyes denoting perfect discernment. At last, John learns that the cross and the one who once died on it 
break open the riddle of our life, telling us that we can live our lives in purposeful living relationship with this, the one successful candidate. As the scriptures tell us, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Jesus. Sometimes I've heard people say, I wonder if you've heard people say this, I can't see where Jesus fits in. They say, God, I can understand, but I can't see where Jesus fits in. The answer was actually given 16 centuries ago by a theologian, Egyptian-born, Greek-trained, called Athanasius. He once said, the only system of thought into which Jesus Christ will fit is the one in which he is the starting point. So there you have it. In the opening sentences of that great Christmas reading in John's Gospel, where we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Of course, the Word is another name for Jesus. So we see him as the starting point of everything. Then the picture begins to come together. Otherwise, we'll be like the man who gets up in the morning, and he's not really seeing straight, he puts his shirt on, and does up his buttons, starting with the wrong button. And after a bit, he may say, oh, it'll probably work out if I just, but no, it'll never work out. It'll never work out. If we don't see Jesus as the starting point of it all, we shall find that our understanding of life and its meaning never quite comes together. There will always be a bit of confusion. Get right about Christ, and then the whole of existence and our universe begins to glow with significance. So it's through the once crucified and now raised Christ that the riddle of life breaks open. And we understand at last that there is meaning, personality, love, purpose at the center of everything. And that the creator has troubled himself. He's troubled himself with you. You say, I'm not important enough for him to trouble you. We are important enough. He has troubled himself with us. The phone is not off the hook. There is someone who loves, visits, has lived among us, suffered and died to bring us into a relationship with himself. John the Evangelist takes it in. The Lamb is the explanation of this world's affairs. He is the fulfillment of our searching. He is the sum and completion of our history. Because as we read here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's his rule. The cross is at the center. There was a day in uh, Brazil some years ago when their famous footballer, Pele, scored his thousandth goal. It was such a sensational goal that they showed it on Brazilian television every day for a year. There were no complaints. Well, there's something about the cross and Christ's victory there over sin, death, evil, and over all that threatens our peace. The book of Revelation is full of it. We can't get away from it. And we're glad not to get away from it. Just as you see that football goal being shown again and again from different camera positions in the replay, so here in the book of Revelation, as we go through it, you find repeatedly God's great act of redemption at the cross being shown from different angles. Sometimes from the point of view of us sinners, sometimes from the point of view of the forgiven church, sometimes from the angle of the unbelieving world, sometimes from how it affected and defeated the satanic underworld, Sometimes from high up in the stands, as we see the cross highlighted from the perspective of heaven as well. So times of spiritual awakening in our history always seem to coincide with a spate of hymns about the cross. I was born during a great revival in East Africa. It incorporated millions of people. This, it's still going on, that revival. So out of it comes songs of the cross. I could hear them across the valleys when I was a little boy, the songs of the revival. I can wake up every day now in Ealing. I live not far away from here. And there it is again as I wake up. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. 
It's a daily thing. Well, it's at this point in John's vision that the singing begins. First, no harder task. Second, no sadder cry. Third, no fitter candidate than Christ. So fourthly, fourthly, no sweeter music than that of Christ's redeemed people. Verse, verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy. There's that word. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you are slain. And with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Yes, here's the universal world master. And John knows it. Of course they sang. We sing. The church down the ages has never stopped singing all through history. The news is good after everything has been said and done. I remember leading a mission in Durham University in the north some years ago. And at the end of one of my addresses, a student came up to me and he said, I want you to know that I've become a Christian tonight. You know, when people say that, you nearly faint. You see, it's such a, oh, you become, oh. I'll. So I, of course, I smiled, I shook him by the hand, I congratulated him. He said, but I've got one more problem. Oh, I said, what's that? Is Jesus Christ it? The final ultimate? Or is he only part of something yet bigger still? like Hinduism. Well, I got out my Bible and I showed him the passage. Actually, I quoted from it a moment ago. Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17. Speaking of Christ, it reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the heir over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. I said, now how does that answer your question? The student looked as though he was going to pop with happiness. <laughs> My search, he said, is over. Yeah, I said, it is over. Yet I said, at the same time, there's a wonderful new life now beginning. Friends, it's not that Christianity solves all our problems. Indeed, becoming a disciple of Christ may even begin a, a new set of problems that weren't there before. But the main, the blockbuster problem is settled for time and eternity. What is life all about? Who are we? What am I? Where do we come from? Where does it all end? How and where am I going to spend eternity? No wonder they sang in John's vision. Yes, there are problems. This is a fallen world. In this book of Revelation, some of the visions of the evil powers we come up against are truly terrifying. The persecutions, the hideous governments, the martyrdoms. As we read, it seems that the satanic powers are here, there, and everywhere. Satan is on the loose, bluffing, scheming, threatening, lying. And where is God all this time? From chapter 4 onwards, God never leaves the throne. He's always in control. He has the center. And whoever has the center has the ultimate power. He will never let go of his precious possession in the members of Christ's forgiven and redeemed family. Never. And so, the singing. And it's not just a region of the world that sings this song. It's not one tribe or nation. No, we are drawn from every quarter and every continent. Then we read of the entire angelic host and every creature in heaven and on earth joining in the hymn of praise. So talk of the hallelujah chorus. And the vision ends here, verse 14. The four living creatures cry, Amen! And the twenty-four elders round the throne of God representing the church of all the ages fall down and worship. So friends, how would you describe your world view? Let's allow this passage to speak to us tonight, to lift us tonight. I doubt if there's a single one of us who's got the whole thing all neatly worked out. But I hope that Revelation 5 has helped. No harder task, no sadder cry, no fitter candidate than Christ, no sweeter music 
and the songs of the redeemed as the last piece in the puzzle fits into place. And others of us, there may be somebody here, might describe ourselves as concerned seekers. We're on a quest. Maybe for us it's a matter of simply taking just step one. Maybe even this very evening or at bedtime. We'll help you all we can. Yet, As uh, Andy said at the start, if somebody would like to come up and get a word with one of us or have a word of prayer. Or, I've got some little booklets here. Look. I like to give away books from time to time to people who are inquirers. Here's a nice one. Me, a Christian, question mark. That's written by a good friend of mine called, called John Chapman. He's in Australia. Here's one little one I wrote, Making a Start. There's another one I wrote, A New Beginning. Have we got any others? I think I've got one called a, Finding a Meaning. Well, ask me for one. You can just take it away, have a look through it. In, uh, I think, one or two of these, there's a little prayer even that I can take step one, just step one, into the answers to the questions that we could be asking. Jesus Christ, we can say, you are the lamb once slain. Now you are risen. You are alive forever. Thank you for dying for me. I am on my way in. I'm sorry for keeping you at a distance for so long. Forgive me by the power of your cross. From now on, I want you to occupy the central stronghold of my life, always and forever. So I'll keep these on me, in my, put them in my pocket. Cracking life's code, friends, it's, it's done. You see here. The guesswork is over. All that I have to do with John is to acknowledge that the once slain lamb is going to be at the center point of the little raft that makes up my worldview. What's the alternative? The alternative is a life without a lasting and true aim and with niggling uncertainties which won't go away. Well, such aimlessness was summed up by a Japanese thinker. He became a fine Christian. His name was Toyohiko Kogawa. He worked in the slums of Kobe. Years ago he commented, I read in a book that a man called Christ went about doing good. It is very disconcerting that I am so easily satisfied with just going about. I think we'll sing now a song based on this very passage. Thank you so much for listening. Let's now sing together. We'll do some singing at this point.